It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Larry LeSeur and Winston Burdett, both of the CBS television news staff. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Mrs. Ivy Baker Priest, treasurer of the United States. Mrs. Priest, most of us have seen your signature on our currency, but if many people are like myself, we're curious about just what the treasurer of the United States actually does. Do you really sit at a desk all day signing dollar bills? Well, I'm sure, Mr. Lucera, that most people have visions of me sitting there signing all of those bills. Actually, I don't sign the bills. They're, the signature is, of course, sent down to the Bureau of Printing and Engraving and, and uh, engraved on the bills. However, I do have a great deal of routine signing to do. We, I have to sign for the moving of, of uh, coins from mints to Federal Reserve banks and, and uh, to foreign depositories and so on. Much routine signing. However, uh, I find a good many people do, uh, like you, want to know what the duties of the United States Treasurer happen to be and how that differs from the job of the Secretary of the Treasury. I'd say it's a minor difference. The Secretary of the Treasury is the boss of the whole works. He is the policy making, of course, and uh, the cabinet member. But the Treasury of the United States, in brief, is the banker of the country. We do everything a bank does except loan money. But, of course, I don't think any bank has the volume of business that, uh, that the Treasurer's office handles in the course of a year. Would you be interested in knowing a little about that? Yes, mm -hmm. indeed. Well, I think there are about 300 million checks a year drawn against the Treasurer's office. And we keep, uh, we redeem uh, mutilated and worn out currency at the rate of about a billion, 500 million pieces a year. Well, how long does a dollar bill actually last in circulation? Uh, the life of a dollar bill is somewhere between nine and ten months, Mr. Lesseur. Uh, the larger denominations, of course, will last a little longer. And then they wear out. Well, yes, they wear out. And the one dollar bill wears out after nine months. That's right, mm -hmm. and it comes back to us where we, of course, uh, destroy it. Well, yes. Mrs. Priest, isn't it true that all of our currency must be backed by uh, silver certificates or silver bullion? And just what would you do if the amount of currency you issued uh, didn't balance with the amount of silver bullion and silver certificates in the Treasury. Well, I can't conceive of that situation coming about because I'm sure that it would, but don't forget we have all that gold at Fort Knox. I see. Well, do you actually uh, balance your own checkbook well? Oh, well, yes. I uh, have had to do that all my life, so uh, that's uh, second nature. <laughs> well, this administration did run a survey of the uh, gold in Fort Knox. Can you tell us was it actually all there? Yes, the Secretary of the Treasury had uh, a full accounting and audit of all of the uh, assets on hand. The gold at Fort Knox, the, the, um, the gold on hand at the mints and so on. He had a complete audit and we found everything to be in order. Well, Mrs. Priest, since uh, money is your job and money, of course, is a subject of universal interest, you must, must get a good deal of interesting mail. But you're that. quite right, I do, and from all over the world, as a matter of fact, and I, I like to, to, to get mail. I hope that my writers will continue to um, write me whenever they feel that they have something they like to tell me. However, as most people, there's always one or two letters that come in which create the chuckles, and I had one about two weeks ago, uh, which I think uh, you would enjoy hearing about. This man wrote in and he said, my dear Madam Treasurer, I'm getting sick and tired of reading about this huge national debt and about the government's inability to balance the budget and about all this deficit spending when the solution to the whole thing is so simple. Now, he said, I guess that's why you people haven't found out about it back there. It's too simple. But he said, you waste all that paper printing the money on both sides. Now, why don't you just print the money on one side, sell the other side for advertising, you got it licked. <laughs> I guess a lot of advertisers will think they were lucky bucks. But Mrs. Priest, actually, you've been a housewife, uh, you're a mother, and you were formerly the assistant chairman of the women's division of the Republican National Committee. How do you actually account for the 
recent upsurge in women's interest in politics? Well, I think women all over the country, Mr. Lucero, have, have uh, shown a marked interest in politics the last few years. It isn't just something that's happened all at once, however. In my opinion, I think it has been a slow and steady growth. Uh, the nonpartisan women's clubs uh, have cr uh, helped materially in creating that interest in, in uh, creating an interest on the part of women to, to know more about their government and to take more active part in uh, in local governmental affairs in the politics of their communities and and their state and so on and this uh, interest uh, is being manifest now by we find uh, many more women are appearing before state legislatures and taking more interest in their city councils and so on because they have uh, realizing more and more of course that the laws affect all of us and uh, and uh, so if we want good government, we're going to all have to be interested much more in our government. Well, Mrs. Priest, while we're on the subject of politics, uh, you've said in the past that uh, it was probably women who ha were the decisive factor in the election of President Eisenhower. Well, in light of that, how do you account then for last Tuesday's Democratic sweep in the local elections? Well, uh, what do you mean, Mr. Lucero? I haven't had a breakdown on that. Do you, uh, were there more? Uh, well, was in New York, vote on that? I know that more women did register than men, and of course. Uh, and did the they vote? I'm not sure of that, but I know that the Democrat was elected. Well, they might, there may be more women registered. I'd be interested in knowing if they voted. You see, in the last election, the women cast 52% of the total national vote. They actually have a, a uh, voting potential of 54%. Uh, and I know that uh, they, they registered and voted in, 50, in the 52 elections, and it was 52% of the total vote. So I'd be very much interested in a breakdown to see just how the, what the woman vote was in this last election. Well, well, that was a very uh, diplomatic answer. We, we, we <laughs> can't prove anything there, but, but to broaden Larry Lasser's question, uh, Mrs. Priest, uh, what comment would you make on the results of the New Jer of the, I'm thinking particularly of the New Jersey elections, uh, because uh, New Jersey was taken more or less as a, a statewide test of, uh, of political sentiment, uh, the best one we had, and of course it did go democratic in both the uh, vital elections there. Well, I, I don't know that that uh, would uh, be setting any particular trend. However, I do think there is a lesson to be learned in, in the results of those elections. I do feel that um, uh, perhaps the Republican Party is not telling the story as it should, because after all, I think that a good many people realize, and certainly many more should realize, that the things that have to be done for the good of this country are not easy, requires sacrifice on the part of all of us. And no administration can go in and uh, uh, um, make every group happy. You simply can't give uh, this group, that group, and the other group everything that it, it feels it must have and need. There's bound to be some hurts somewhere along the line. We have to make sacrifices, but we're still citizens of the greatest country in the world, and we still are extremely fortunate and should be giving thanks each day that we are so fortunate, and, and I do believe that if we, we get the story over and people, the American people know uh, the facts and know what we, we are facing, I have a great deal of confidence in the fact mm. that they are not averse to tightening the belt and taking it. Well, Mrs. Priest, uh, actually you come from Utah, and uh, Utah we all know is a great cattle raising, mining, and agricultural state. Uh, Secretary of Agriculture Benson also comes from Utah. That's right. Can you tell us about the sentiment uh, regarding Secretary Benson in your home state? Oh, I think in the home state, the, 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 uh, the sentiment, the majority sentiment would be that they feel Secretary Benson uh, can certainly outline a program that will not only be of great benefit to this country, but to the farmers as well. And after all, that's ultimately what we want. And I think they have great confidence in his ability to do this, uh, but certainly he must have time. No program of the size and scope of the agricultural program can be put into effect overnight. And another thing I'd like to say here, Mr. Lesseur, is that um, uh, perhaps uh, we're going to be heard a little here and there. Perhaps many people have all and, and various segments of our population have been heard a little here and there, but it's far better to be heard a little in an orderly readjustment to a sound basis from which we can build our economy than to have had the whole thing collapse like a house of cards. Mr. Priest, to go press forward on politics again, you were actually a leader of the so-called Young Turks that were responsible for nominating General Eisenhower at the Chicago conventions. 
could you tell us now from your position in washington do you think that the split has been healed in the ranks of the republican party oh i think mr sir there was a very definite attempt right from the chicago convention on uh, to bring the party together and i think that re with the full realization that of course we would have to work together if we were going to bring about a program for the for uh, the good of the country and another thing there's always room in any political party for divergent opinions for differences of opinions that's how we grow a healthy difference of opinion uh, but as far as a, a so-called split in the party I very definitely think that all party people have been working diligently toward the solution of the many problems that beset this administration well Mrs. Pierce has a final question uh, do you think that uh, women in general now have a grasp of the fundamental economics of our country? Well, I think they have always had a grasp, Mr. Lissier. After all, you know, uh, uh, in most families, the women uh, sort of look after the income and outgo. They have to balance the budget. They have to stretch that dollar as far as it will go. And I like to say that the average uh, woman runs a little government right in her own family. She knows about budgeting. She knows about health and welfare. And certainly she has to be a diplomat. And I would say also that she, if she has more than one child, she knows all about pressure groups. <laughs> so really, I, I feel that uh, women, women do know a great deal about budgeting, and it's quite fitting that women should handle the money, I think. I believe you remember a little about the controversy about whose picture should be on the money, and I think you remember we decided that men could have their faces on the money as long as women got their hands on it. It would be the way it would go. Well, thank you very much, Mrs. Ivy Baker-Priest, uh, for being with us tonight. I wish your picture were on the dollar bill. Oh, thank you, Mr. Lesseur. <laughs> the opinions you've heard our speakers express tonight have been entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longine Chronoscope was Larry Lesseur and Winston Burdett, both of the CBS television news staff. Our distinguished guest was Mrs. Ivy Baker-Priest, Treasurer of the United States. Every year about this time, the great arena in New York's Madison Square Garden comes alive with color and drama as international society assembles for the National Horse Show. And this year again, here, as in the great horse shows of Paris, Rome, Madrid, and elsewhere, Longines is exclusive official watch for all timing. As the thoroughbreds compete for championship ribbons, the judges consider two factors, their time performance and their beauty. Now, for exactly the same reasons, discriminating people the world over make their choice of a fine watch. Longines, the world's most honored watch. The only watch in history to win for accuracy of performance and beauty of design, 10 World's Fair Grand Prizes, 28 gold medals, and highest honors at the great government observatories. The new Longines watches for Christmas giving, now featured by authorized Longines Whitnor jewelers from coast to coast, are conceived in exquisite good taste and manufactured to Longines' exacting standard of performance. You'll find a style and a type for every need and for every purpose. And yet this Christmas, you may proudly give a Longines watch for as little as $71.50. Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company. Since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. This is Frank Knight reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold in service from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, agency for Longines Whitnor watches. <laughs> There's only one Atmos, a perpetual motion clock created by Le Coultre. Atmos runs without winding, without electricity powered only by unfailing daily variations in the temperature of the air. Atmos, product of Le Coultre, division of Longines Whitnor. It's fun, the Jackie Gleason Show on the CBS Television Network. <laughs>